Good evening, and welcome to the Mid-American Gardener. My name's Mike Brunk, and I'm the Urbana City Arborist. I'm sitting in for Diane tonight as host in return for a chocolate croissant and a large black coffee. Well, we're, we're happy to have you this evening, and as always, we're ready to answer your questions, so please call us at 333-3495. My guests this evening are Chuck Voigt and Dyke Barkley. And let's start with you tonight, Chuck. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've brought. Okay, uh, I retired at the end of 2015 from the Department of Crop Sciences here at the University of Illinois. Uh, my main areas of interest were vegetables and herbs, but I can do some ornamental plants and, and some other stuff as well if, if need be. Uh, tonight I, I brought in some, some things from a garden center and I'm <clears throat> I'm going to tell you what not to do. <laughs> uh, it, it's an ongoing rant for me uh, to see Brussels sprouts out and, and for sale in the spring because that's not when you start Brussels sprouts. You should start them in June, transplant them in July, and then they mature in the cool weather of fall and uh, they don't have so much nasty bitterness and, and those kinds of things. Uh, so I, I try to remind people of that. Uh, the garden centers can't not have them because people go and look for them. And what I want you to put pressure on them to do is to have them available in July as opposed to March and April. Uh, also, uh, tomatoes and peppers are out. And if you're seeing this live, it, it's still a little soon to be, to be risking those out here in central Illinois. If you're far south of here, then maybe it's getting close. Uh, but we certainly had early warm weather this year, which got people uh, really revved up and, and, and ready to go. And so uh, tomatoes and peppers, probably better if, if you feel like they're, they're, they're ready to be moved out of their little cell packs. You should probably uh, move them into a larger pot and, and keep them where you can control them a little bit as opposed to putting them out in the ground. Uh, if, you, if you feel like you must put them in the ground, then you're going to need hot caps or a row cover or something to, uh, to protect them. And then we come to uh, basil and sweet potatoes. And these are tropicals and, and cold weather below 50 degrees stunts them, messes them up. And so uh, here certainly Memorial Day is as early as we want to have these things out. Um, so try to remember that. Uh, this is an interesting way to sell uh, sweet potato plants, I thought. Um, it's good because you get a plant that's not gonna, going to be stressed very much when you plant it. But what I found when I root cuttings and, and, and plant those after they've been in a cell is that when you dig them, you have a group of roots that, <laughs> that are tied in a gigantic knot. And you've got you know, maybe two or three pound roots that are uh, just tightly clamped onto the others. So uh, <clears throat> maybe if, if, if you do buy plants this way, uh, when you take them out of there, kind of shake off the soil that's there and try to get the roots aligned and, and get two or three nodes in the ground so that uh, you can get good rooting and, and go from there. So uh, don't, get, don't get too too excited too early. Good advice. Don't we all this time of year? Yeah, I, I remember a time on May 24th in, in northeastern Illinois when it got down in the 20s and it actually froze a crust on the ground. May 24th, so. That's past Mother's Day. That's <laughs> way past Mother's Day. That's almost <laughs> Memorial Day. Okay, Dyke, how about you? All right, uh, my name's Dyke Barkley and I kind of wear two hats. I'm the horticulture and ag instructor down at Lakeland College as well as uh, run my own place, Barkley Farms Nurseries kind of specializing in perennials and ornamental grasses. And sometimes I get asked, why would I carry 80 different kinds of ornamental grass? And so I brought some with me tonight and see if they'll show up on the air. But uh, all three of these that I brought are actually types of big blue stem. Uh, native grasses are becoming more and more popular. And if, if you look at these, a real subtle difference between them, but uh, um, here the one closest to me is uh, Red October and it's already got maroon tips showing up. So what you'd normally think of as a little bit of fall color is gonna start showing up in, in early summer. Uh, the one in the middle is Lord Snowden, which has got a bluish cast to it. Um, and the one on the right is called Big Daddy, and you can see it's a lighter green. It's actually gonna be the tallest of all three and actually weeps a little bit. So there's a little minute difference between them. 
And if you compare them to the true native uh, big blue stem, they're a little more refined, a little more ref uh, uniform in height and, and uh, don't reseed quite as bad. So they've kind of made some improvements on the true native plant, but yet hang on to their toughness and, and uh, you know, can handle this Illinois weather that we seem to be bouncing up and down. So good, tough grasses. Okay, thank you, Dyke. Well, I have a question that was mailed in that I'm going to answer, and it's about a peach tree. Uh, this is from Heather uh, of Gillespie, Illinois. And so uh, she has uh, had a peach tree uh, for a little over five years. Uh, I guess they planted two dwarf peach trees, uh, and they had purchased them from a local uh, store. Uh, last year, uh, her father noticed some of the leaves looked odd, but we still had an abundant harvest of little peaches. This year, the leaves look odd again. Now, what is happening to my peach trees? Well, you have the dreaded peach leaf uh, curl, and uh, it won't kill the tree, uh, but it will uh, certainly mar up the fruit, and um, it does inhibit um, getting good fruit from the peaches. So, uh, what you can do about that, it's a fungus. Uh, it's too late to treat the tree this year, but you can treat. Uh, for that uh, uh, problem and you want to treat the tree prior to the uh, buds swelling in spring, so that would be next spring. And if you want to find out the details on that, you can uh, look up on the website, the University of Illinois Home Yard and Garden Pest Newsletter. Uh, and basically you can Google Peach Leaf Curl Home Yard and Garden Pest and you'll probably pull it right up and research uh, the, the uh, solutions to peach leaf curl. So next I want to uh, present to everybody uh, a gardening trip. So uh, I'd like to uh, have you join Mid-American Gardener on Thursday, May 25th for a gardening field trip. We'll visit Danville Gardens for a very special gardening demonstration by a master gardener then we're off to County Ar Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana for another Master Gardener demonstration and you'll have time to shop at both of those locations. Then it's back to Campbell Hall for dinner and a seat in the live studio audience for the 25th anniversary episode of the Mid-American Gardener. Wow, it's been 25 years. We'll have coffee, cake, and plenty of garden talk after the show. Visit www.illinois.edu slash WILL Travel for more information or call 217-333-7300. Okay. So next let's move on before we go to our callers and uh, we have a do, Did You Know video on spiders. Spiders prey on insects. However, spiders can only consume liquids because they lack the ability to chew. The spider uses digestive juices to turn their prey into liquids that they can ingest. Okay, that was very interesting. Let's go to our callers. We have Sandra on line two. You have a question about a tomato worm? Yes, I wondered what you could do to Get rid of them little burgers when the time comes. Tomato worms. Or prevent them from even being there. I, are we talking about the tomato hornworm? Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just uh, go out and scout them, and when you first see that first foliar damage up, they usually start up in the top of the plant. And if you look down on the ground, they start pooping on the ground, and you can see their little pellets, mm -hmm. and, and kind of track them that way. And if if you get them when they're when they're, as soon as you see that, and, and get out there, uh, early in the morning or or in the afternoon, uh, the contrast seems to be better when the sun is up straight overhead. The green of the of the of the caterpillar and the green of the foliage kind of look alike. Uh, plus, they may hide a little more if it's getting hot in the middle part of the day. But the best way to do it early is to just find them as small as you can and, and get rid of them. Um, once it starts to, to uh, once it's, if, if they get out of control, uh, then you might want to think about uh, sprays or, or something else to, to get rid of them. Um, as the season progresses, you'll see the little, the little wasp uh, 
cocoons that are uh, on the back of them and they usually say you should leave those because each one of those is going to be a wasp that's going to intern lay eggs and some more of them uh, but but the wasps seem like they lag behind the infestation a little bit so you out there um, doing away with them how, uh, by hand it, yeah. uh, it, you know if you're, if you're not dealing with with an acre of tomato plants uh, you should be able to keep them fairly well under control just with observation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about line three? Nancy, you have a question about a clematis. Line three, Nancy? Yes, my name's Nancy. And I have a clematis that is about four years old. And every year it comes up with tons of blooms on it. This year it only had blooms about two feet up. And then it's bare except for a lot of leaves. And then about five and a half feet, there is a few more buds like they're going to bloom. I want to know what happened to the middle section. Good question. You know, we did have uh, some warm weather. Things mm -hmm. did bud out, and then we got a freeze. You think that could have uh, possibly been part of the problem? Well, yeah. I, I, I some sprays around the house. And I wondered, could some of the spray have gotten on it and kept it from flowering? No, I think if you had an overspray, you'd have plant problems, not just the flowers. I, I would say it's more some clematis flower on you know certain age wood. I would just say you're right. Something either froze it back or something happened to that section. I don't think if it's still looking good, I don't know as I would do anything. But yeah, the, the large flower, early flowering ones, uh, sometimes can benefit by being pruned back fairly strongly uh, late winter, early spring, and then it forces lots of strong new growth, which then, which then uh, flowers, because they, they can, uh, the old woody parts of them don't seem, to, so, don't seem to survive all that well you know, in multiple years. Mm -hmm. So a renewal pruning every, I don't know, two, three years, just, just to reinvigorate it seems to, seems to get better flower distribution on, on it when it grows back. Interesting, okay. Well, I hope that answers your question. Let's move on to line four, Julie. Now her question is, which manure is best? <laughs> I know we're all experts in that. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite is rabbit. <laughs> is, is Julie there? Julie, line four. All right, well, let's move on to uh, Lawrence on line five. Lawrence has spots on tomato leaves. Lawrence? Yes. Yes, about the last part of July, I start getting spots, very small spots on the tomato leaves. It seems to make the plants eye to start losing leaves. It kind of climbs up the plant until the whole plant it seems to be dead. Any idea what that is? It sounds like early blight. That's the, the one that typically gets onto tomatoes. Um, it overwinters in the soil. Uh, also, if you, if you use the same tomato cages year after year, I'm suspicious that it might, it might hang out there. Um, for soil-wise, uh, some people will, will plant their tomato plants and then mulch them heavily with straw or something so that uh, soil particles aren't going to be splashing up onto the lower leaves. And if you can keep it from infecting the lower leaves and it doesn't climb the ladder of the, of the, of the leaves up the plant later on. Um, I, I've also seen demonstrations on TV where as the plants start to elongate, they'll take off the first couple of sets of leaves just so that they're not available to, to start that process. Uh, certainly, uh, a protective fungicide could also give you some, give you some help too. So maybe a combination of of mulching, maybe re removing some of the lower leaves, and uh, and certainly air circulation is also a good thing. So hmm. okay, all right. <clears throat> well, we have a another round of emails that I'd like to go through, and we each have some questions here. So uh, uh, Chuck, let's. Uh, Let's hear yours. Okay, I had this once before when I was on and didn't get to it. So it's a catnip question. Uh, Mike says, each year I grow catnip for my son's cats 
and I've been looking for uh, a way to trim the plants to cause them to bush out more and have a greater yield. Well, as with a lot of the, the minty herbs, uh, if you let them just grow up and, and flower, that's pretty much the end of the deal. But if when you first uh, see the, the flower head that we just saw, like when it's in a stage like this, go in and, and just pinch out the tips, leave a couple of, a couple of sets of leaves, and it, they should branch and, and continue to grow out like that. And then uh, each time they get out, maybe eight sets of leaves or four sets of leaves, eight leaves, uh, just continue to, to take out the tips and, and uh, dry that and, and you'll have happy cats all winter. Wow. Yeah, the trick's gonna be to pinch it early and not yes. wait till the plant gets big and huge. So exactly. If it got started, if you've got it and it's already getting up, it, it, you, you pinch it early. You don't wait until it's big and floppy. And, yeah. yeah. And Dyke, do you have a question about uh, e or, uh, impatience? Yeah, I've got a question here about impatience. Wants to know if it's gonna be a safe season to plant them. Um, I think what the, the, the caller was, or the email was asking, um, is the downy mildew that gets on typical uh, impatience now. Uh, impatience were a great plant for the shade, but that disease moves in and kind of makes a white fuzz on the underside and the plants decline really quickly. The answer's kind of been to uh, switch over and go to some newer hybrids that are using New Guinea blood and New Guinea impatience and some other impatience like uh, Sun Patients or um, Bounce, or there's several coming out on the market that seem to be more disease resistant. So um, can, you, can, you, can you plant Impatients and not get the disease? Yes, I think it's gonna be very inconsistent. You, you've gotta have the right weather conditions uh, for that disease to move in. So, you know, you could have good luck and your neighbor may not. So I think if you plant straight in patients, it's kind of a, a risk thing. And once, if you ever do get it, uh, I think it can stick around quite a while in the soil. So um, that's definitely try some of the other in, in patients or hybrids that are resistant to it is probably gonna be the answer. I'll rotate your crops just like a yeah. good farmer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and I have a, an email myself uh, about watering spruces. And uh, this is from Josh, and he recently built a berm in his yard, and he's wanting to plant a couple uh, eight-foot spruces, and he's been told by some nurseries that uh, the trees are fine, you can leave them alone, you don't need to really worry about watering them too much uh, uh, because they've grown on mountains. Uh, and then other nurseries have told him that uh, you should water them on a regular basis. He's wanting to know how exactly do I water these trees? Well, that's a, a good question. And I think um, the nurseries that were, you were talking to were probably worried about overwatering because it's a common problem, especially when you put a hose out there and you walk away from it, and you come back four hours later and turn it off. So uh, what you need to do is measure your water that you are putting on your trees and an easy way to do that. Now, let me step back and say, Josh, you're on a berm, so you've probably got pretty good drainage anyhow. But an easy way to measure your water is to know that a tree needs, a young tree that's newly planted, one gallon of water, one or two gallons of water per caliper inch of trunk diameter. So if you're putting in about three inch uh, spruce trees, then if you put uh, three gallons of water on that, and how do you measure that? Well, a gallon uh, milk jug is real easy. Put a little pinhole in that at the bottom on the side, and put three of them around the base of the tree, fill them up, let them go, and do that once every five days uh, during the growing season for the first three years. So you really just need to focus on watering new trees for the first three years, and then they can kind of get a hold and take off on their own. So uh, let's move on to our uh, next mag quiz video, and then we'll come back to some questions. What is a green gym? A, an eco-friendly fitness center, B, an inexperienced James? C, Kermit's brother? D, a gardening tool? A, an eco-friendly fitness center. Well, I like working, outside, working out <laughs> outside. I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, that's why I chose my profession. So is that a eco gym? All right, let's go to line six. Mary, you have a question about the ash borer? Yes, I had I had four big ash trees and a one small one. And of course, I've lost them all. But now my cherry trees are dying. Could that have anything to do with the ash borer? Um, my answer would be no. no. 
Uh, they haven't found the emerald ash borer to be moving on to any other trees. There was a fluke that we heard about, um, I don't know, it's maybe been five years ago, about finding an emerald ash borer in a fringe tree, I believe, but uh, no, that, that, that ash borer is not moving on to other species. So there's something else going on with your cherry tree. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of borers that like cherry trees, just not the emerald ash borer. Right. Could, could very well be boar, a boar, but, but not the emerald ash borer. So the best thing you can do if the trees are suffering is to keep them watered during dry periods. Uh, maybe think about fertilizing if you don't already fertilize your, your turf. So uh, just keeping them healthy and stress-free. Line two, Virginia, you have a question about uh, red October grass. Yes. Uh, yes. Do they... Uh Number one, can they be planted on the north side of the house? Um, how far apart do I plant it, and how do I fertilize it? Uh, typical ornamental grasses, a lot of them need full sun, and full sun would be six hours. Mm. Could you get by with three or four? So if you're on the north side on a corner and get me some, some partly, but if it's, if it's totally shade, these ornamental grasses, uh, there are some different kinds that could take more shade than this, but... Uh, the big, most of the native grasses need full sun, so uh, I prefer six. I could cheat with three or four if you put it on the corner. Um, uh, spacing, it kind of depends on which grass you're picking at, but like red October, I would space them. They're going to grow about two feet across and about four feet tall. Um, fertilizer, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, if you're going to, I just wouldn't fertilize. I'd, I'd mulch it and let it grow that way. Fertilizing is going to get you... It's like fertilizing your lawn. You're gonna get a tall growing plant. However, we, we don't mow it, so as soon as you get some blooms, they'll fall over because they've stretched too big. So putting fertilizer on these ornamental grasses don't, doesn't gain you anything. You're better off to mulch it and amend the soil if you've really got bad soil. And they'll, but they're tough. I mean, they'll, they'll take off and go, but uh, I would not use a, a nitrogen-like fertilizer. Wouldn't help you. And with the ornamental grasses in shade, what do they look like when there's not enough sun? Do they fall over? They well, now that it, some of them really vary, but mainly you're not going to get much in the way of flowers if you're planting one for bloom, but they're going to be thin, much slower, not as thick. Like the ones that get the maroon tips, you aren't going to see the color variations. The blue ones aren't going to turn blue. You're going to, they'll pretty much stay a green. Now, there are some smaller grasses that will take the shade that have color if you need that. But, it, uh, you know, there's a lot. I mean, when you've got 80 different kinds, there's a lot of different variations. But... Most of the native grasses need sun. Okay, thanks, Dyke. Line three, Susan, you have a question about mulch on vegetables. Susan? Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you for taking my call. I have two uh, raised garden beds, and both of them have vegetables in them, and everything is coming up, the radishes, the onions, the um, bush beans, the lettuce, and the beets. I have very good soil in both raised beds, my question is, should you put mulch uh, around those vegetables, I guess just to keep them good and to keep the soil good and also uh, for all the rain that we're having, you know, to hold something in? Well, <clears throat> to, to even out the moisture supply, yes. Uh, mulch on top of lots and lots of rainfall doesn't, that's probably the situation where you need mulch the least. Uh, you know, in a raised bed, you're not talking about a, like a slope where you want mulch to hold it, to keep it from, from running away. Um, a lot of the things you mentioned are, are very quick, cool weather crops. And so uh, things that mature within the, the spring season are less likely uh, for a mulch to have a, a, a giant um, positive effect. Uh, things that grow through the heat of the summer uh, benefit m much more from, from a mulch where, where mo moisture might start to get limiting, uh, soil temperature might get too high. Um, so if you've got some, some mulch material, maybe yes. Uh, certainly if you have compost, uh, put, a, put a layer of that on. Um, and <laughs> until it dries out, uh, it, it, it's probably not necessary. And you have to be careful not to put your, your mulch right up to the crown of the plant and, or have it too thick. Right, because you just encourage disease and, and slugs when it's, yeah, sure. when it's damp already. Okay, so uh, we've got a, a short amount of time here. Maybe we can fit in one more question. Uh, line four, Kate. Hi. 
Hi. Um, I have uh, planted miscanthus along my driveway, and they're kind of out of control. And I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of them. Are they extremely deeply rooted? Am I going to have to poison them to kill them? We've got we've got a real short amount of time. So digging them up, I think, is probably your best. Digging bet. them up, and no, they're not deep. You just got to get the growing points, which aren't that deep. I make it sound easy. It's not going to be easy chopping because if they're big, heavy clumps. But uh, no, the roots aren't really deep. So okay, it shouldn't be impossible. A backhoe might depending on how big a mascanthus it is. <laughs> okay, we're out of time already, so I want to thank Chuck and Dyke for their time this evening, and all of you watching, and for supporting WILL and the Mid-American Gardener. Don't forget to check out our website. Tune us in next week, and have a good evening. <laughs>